Welcome back, Mac and Joe. Thank you so much. Uh, these men are always willing to come home, and for that we are very thankful. And now it's time to welcome another great man from Hope who will join his friends on stage. Our featured speaker was the 42nd President of the United States, the first Democrat president in six decades to be elected twice. <clears throat> Since leaving office, he has continued to be guided by the ideals that shaped his presidency. Building on his lifetime of public service, he established the Clinton Foundation on the simple belief that everyone deserves a chance to succeed. Everyone has a responsibility to act and we all do better when we work together. His leadership at the Clinton Foundation has helped millions of people build better futures for themselves, their families, and their communities. I think we can all agree that the world wouldn't be the same today without President Clinton's more than 40 years of public service. I also think we can all agree that President Clinton plays one mean saxophone. <laughs> So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Welcome home, Mr. President. Welcome home. So, Mr. President and Joe, I think we have been looking for a hometown crowd, and I think we found one. It's an authentic I th one. I think we've got it. And it's, we're in a lot nicer venue than we ever were in our prime. <laughs> so, <laughs> I want to thank the school for having us here and for what they're doing. It's great. Well, I'll, I'll second that for sure. Chris yeah. Thomason, you and your team have just done a great job, Becky Moore and Dennis Ramsey. You bet. Clay Lance. Clay Lance building on the leadership of Rodney Orr and Mitch Bobo at the Hope Chamber. We're, we're proud to be here. So, Mr. President, as I was thinking about tonight, I could not help but remember January 14th, 1994. We were in Russia for our first international summit meeting with Boris Yeltsin. We were assembled in the Kremlin meeting room there on a cold, snowy day. And you passed me a note across that table as we were waiting for Boris Yeltsin and his team to enter. With what we anticipated would be a complicated, difficult, and potentially contentious meeting. And that note that you penned had that date and location of Moscow. You said, Mac, a long way from hope. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. That's a keeper. What I think that suggested is both of us, and certainly you as the 42nd President of the United States, were really thinking about our values, who we were and where we had come from, and how that would serve us in that critical meeting. So, Mr. President, if you will, I have talked a lot about your childhood here with your grandparents, when your mother showed such great resilience and courage to go back to nursing school and get her degree after the loss of your father. And you've talked about that, and I think that's the right place for us to start at tonight's program. Well, thanks. I, um, first of all, that fateful day was, June the 14th, was only eight days after my mother died. So I was in Hope, Arkansas at the cemetery it's a couple of days, and we had to go do this day, uh, this trip. Yep. It couldn't be put off. Russia was very unstable. But I always got along with Yeltsin because, <laughs> like me, he grew up in a small village, and he lived on a farm. And we like to pretend that, you know, it was pretty bad in Arkansas after World War II when our per capita income was only about half the national average. 
Yeltsin really slept on the straw yeah. with the animals. Yeah. But I always had a connection with him because of that. And when I got there, he had had a painting about so big of my mother uh, in one of their little Russian ceramic frames that almost looked like a photograph. And I've, it has been on the, the ledge of every fireplace and every house I've lived in since I was there. And I think it was one of the reasons we got a lot of stuff done that for make the world safer because Yeltsin was a farmer. He was too smart to believe in communism and it had been a fraud. And he really hated it and he didn't want to go back to communism. On the other hand, he didn't want to see the country go start raving crazy and not take care of ordinary people and give them a chance to go to school. And so when his politicians would tell him, you got to watch Clinton, you know, he'll maneuver around here and take advantage of you. <laughs> I never made an argument to him, not once, about what was best for us. I always said, I think this is best for you, and this is why. I learned that here. And I tell everybody who will listen, I, I was the luckiest person in the world because I was born at the end of World War II before the television culture. I was born in a small town where people knew each other's stories and saw each other whole as three-dimensional people, not little cartoons like we're all portrayed on TV in first one place and another. And um, I think that's something that I really value. Not just my grandfather, who had that little now famous store across the street from the cemetery, but uh, my uncle, Oren Grisham, and his wife, Ollie, and they used to have us for lunch, and I just listened to people tell stories, and they could make anybody that lived in Hope sound utterly fascinating. <laughs> and because they knew something funny about them, some quirk of their personality, some, you know, they didn't have any balance and they stepped in the water all the time. Something funny about everybody. And they taught me to pay attention. And uh, I've got a chief of staff now, a wonderful woman from Georgia, and she said, you know, your life was a lot more interesting before you were ever elected anything. <laughs> she said, you know, you're like Zelig. You just wandered around and things happened. And, uh, I said, no more than anybody else, I was just paying attention. Only because I was raised here. I didn't know a single soul could afford an out-of-state vacation. You know, what we had here was gospel singings, square dancing, the county fair, and storytelling. And, uh, it wouldn't do any harm in an America so divided and upset if people learned each other's story more. Because once I hear your story, you're a person more than a Republican or a Democrat or black, white, or brown or Jewish, Christian, or Muslim or anything else. Once I hear your story first, you're a person. Then I get to take all that other stuff into account. If you start taking everything else into account before you know what the person is, you're almost always going to be wrong, either too gullible or too hard-hearted and dunderheaded. So I owe that to all of you, and mostly to your parents and grandparents. But I had a great time, and it's stunning what I can remember from when I was four, five, and six. Now, it's easy for me to remember kindergarten because I was so stupid I went to kindergarten in a pair of cowboy boots when we were jumping rope that day. <laughs> and I broke my leg above the knee. And then the, the, the doctor, I actually got good medical care. They said, you're five years old, you're growing like a weed, and you've broken your leg above the knee, so we're not going to put you in a cast because it might stunt your growth. And instead, they drilled a hole in my ankle and put a sterling uh, stainless steel, excuse me, a bar through it and hooked it to a horseshoe and strung me up. So for those of you that don't like anything I ever did, there were two months there when you could easily have gotten rid of me. 
because I was just laying there. But anyway, I thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. And then I came back to hope over and over and over again. If there used to be a, a sandwich board, a sign board that they'd put in the middle of 2nd and Main in the summertime when the Hope Legionnaires were playing at Fair Park. And there are probably not a lot of folks that here that remember the Hope Legionnaires. But Mac, in just a second, is going to recite to you <laughs> the whole starting lineup. Who was their catcher, Mac? <laughs> Granville Johnson, but I don't think we need to do that. All right, that. well, wait, wait a minute. Who played second base? <laughs> Bob White played second base. All right, but who's on third? Well, you're giving a good deposition. I think Bill Gunner played third base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the shortstop was? Well, Wayne Johnson. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> we could go <laughs> on and on. But, but, but that's not right. And as much as the era that we grew up in here in Hope in the late 40s and the 50s, and, and, and Mac, in my case, in the early to mid 60s, as much as that was a golden age, I think it was a different time when we weren't bombarded with 24 seven news and headlines and cell phones and people did know and talked more about it. I've made the statement and it's true. If I got in trouble <laughs> at school or anywhere else, I'll guarantee you my mother knew about it by the time I got home. 